over engineer for a little while and then switch to iterating rapidly. Use HashiCorp, best way to over engineer anything. We could probably do hours upon hours of it. You're going to have a thousand versions, 10,000, a million versions of your app. And see what kind of damage and unexpected expenses I can get into with that. Wait, Terraform's not easy to learn? Okay, cool. Recording started. Uh, so we are uploading and we are back with episode nine. It's been a little while, but we are back. Had a little bit of a hiatus. Things things have been happening, uh, but that's all right. Now we have returned. Yeah, I was trying to think what happened last time. I think the last one was around the 4th of July. So it's been a little while, but uh, that's okay. Once a month is pretty good, right? Um, yeah, I was actually, I don't know. I was, I was actually just talking to will about that that uh i don't know we'll see we'll see what happens i may i may start running this every week whether you guys are here or not maybe do some solo episodes yeah. so we'll see be kind of exciting uh but yeah we'll see um little preview of what's to come for the dev sync but um uh, in the meantime though um we had talked about talking about scalability which we didn't get to talk about last time but we wanted to wait for will i think i think eric oh. and i told twice now have been like oh well we'll talk about scalability when Eric, when uh, will is here and he's missed last two so uh, it's like this time we got him so we got it we got to do it while he's here so um he's a bit bit of an expert in it i think now so i uh, figured he's gonna have a lot of input on that so um that's probably what we're gonna cover today so i guess i will tie that back a little bit to so we've done a little bit of we talked about hackathon in the past quite a bit um uh will and i i think yeah unfortunately eric was not able to attend the last one we did so we had a hackathon i don't know a couple weeks ago um and will was kind enough to show me uh the exciting world of kubernetes and uh got to got to practice a little bit of setting up a kubernetes project and using helm helm charts uh and so that was pretty cool so um i was able to get something running on my local machine uh you know, get my my feet wet a little bit in uh, in the the world of Kubernetes, uh, and it's been it's been pretty fun. I was able to uh, let's see, I was able to build like two different apps, uh, so two different images, uh, Docker images that um, I and I'm like getting a feel for like how the workflow actually works now. So I was able to create a front end app and then a back end app, uh, and be able to connect the two. Um, so have them both run through like a Docker Compose, uh, so I can run the individual app and then run them together, and then also then promote them up into a Kubernetes environment, so it actually can run and just just locally. So I've been running it on uh, Minikube, um, so I can get that whole workflow where it's like I can have an interface, have it connect to an API, and I can now run it in a Kubernetes environment on my machine at least, and then tunnel into it to be able to run it like it's an actual app. So I haven't promoted it yet to like an actual uh, service. So I was actually leaning towards like GCP. So maybe uh, push it out to Google Cloud and and see what kind of damage and, uh, you know, unexpected expenses I can get into with that. Um, but uh, but yeah, so scalability is something that's always been kind of interesting to me. I, have, I haven't really like totally learned the proper scalability techniques. So this was kind of a huge unlock for me. It's pretty exciting. Um, I'm sure there's probably other scalability options out there, but this seems to be one of the one of the more common uh, de facto standards. So um, that's my intro for scalability. Kubernetes is good for scalability. So let's uh, let's let's start there. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely is. Um, I mean, there's so much about scalability that's such a broad, right? Because you can you can scale a service, you can scale an architecture, you can scale an API, you can scale a database, right? All those are very different, and how you want to handle those are very very different. Um, and then there's, I guess the two most popular, I'm sure there's maybe subsets of each, but the two most popular is horizontal and vertical scaling. Um, you know, and then there's just like efficiency, which is kind of like, again, another subsect of, of scalability, like being efficient and being cost efficient. So that way when you do scale, it doesn't break the bank, right? So you can't always just scale without thought. Like sometimes you may have to re-architecture things so that way. You can actually handle more requests for less money, you know, all these types of things. I don't know. I mean, where do we're like, where do we want to start? Like I said, it's kind of such a huge topic with so many avenues to go down. Is there a particular thing that we want to hit on first? Uh, first, there, Eric, I guess any, any thoughts to begin with? 
I'm trying to think of where to start. I mean, we've already gotten to like a specific application of scalability, like how to scale a map, right? True. Yes. Um, I mean, we could definitely start there and just kind of keep branching out. I mean, we could probably do hours upon hours of this, but I mean, <laughs> scalability sure. isn't even just talking about like the assets, right? What are you even scaling for? Are you scaling Fair for traffic? Enough. Are you scaling for geography? Are you scaling for cost? Yeah. Right. Like uh, that's, it's yeah. a great question. I was actually going to try and start with something like that, but you said it better in a sense that like there's, there's exactly the purpose of why you're scaling. Like, are you getting so many users on your app? Like it's just, it's blowing up and you need to scale resources to handle those users because maybe your application or your service is slowing down or are you scaling because you built an app on the East coast, but everyone apparently loves it in oceanic and their load times are way too slow. So you're like, okay, I only have a hundred users, but they all live in Australia and it takes them five seconds to load the web page. Maybe I should scale to the oceanic region. So that way I can be, you know, multi-regional and they don't have to wait forever for their page to load. Um, let's, uh, I mean, yeah. let, uh, let's, uh, well, I, was, I guess I was going to say, so Kubernetes, I mean, probably lends itself more towards like horizontal scaling, right? I mean, at least that's and common. vertical. It does and both. vertical. Okay. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. All right. Yeah. Um, then let's, well, let's, I, I feel like the, probably the easiest one is that, that it's like, Hey, you built this app and it's blown up. Somebody tweeted about it. That's famous. And now it has a hundred thousand users overnight. So how do you scale with that? Let's, let's just start there. Well, Kubernetes makes it stupid simple, which is nice. Um, it does a lot of stuff for you. In fact, you can basically just define what you consider a CPU and a memory threshold for your app. So you basically say, if it uses this much CPU, then scale. If it uses this much memory, then scale. And then how much do you want it to scale? You don't want it to go to infinity because you know then you're going to have a thousand versions, 10,000, a million versions of your app, right? And it's going to become stupid. So you give it an upper bound and a lower bound. So you define what your minimum count of the number of replicas of your app is and you know maximum count of the number of replicas. And it does it all for you. That's it. It's just a YAML file. You literally say this much CPU, this much memory, minimum one, right? You can put zero and it will scale down to zero. Um, but I don't know, that's kind of weird. So minimum one and maximum say 25. And uh, yeah, it'll go up to 25. And if it hits the CPU and memory limit at 25, let's go, ah, I'm at my max. Tell me what to do. And it, and you can hook in alerts, right? So you can have Kubernetes send out an alert, say like, I've hit maximum replica count of 25. I'm now at capacity again. And then you can go in and push an update to say, instead of 25, make it 50. And then it'll go, oh, okay. And then it'll scale up to 50 or stop at 40, right? Maybe 40 is the magic number and then it stops. It makes it stupid easy, actually. Yeah. The And then, then the thresholds, right? So, man, such a hard thing to answer if we don't have like an exact scenario we're trying to scale, right? Fair enough. If you're trying to scale like just the app side, maybe just throwing a whole bunch of instances of the app are good enough. I think we've learned... We, Will, you and I have definitely learned uh, you can't just throw new things at a problem and it just magically fixes, right? Yep. There's underlying things of like, okay, so you threw 35 app nodes at it. Can the database handle 35 open connections and all like, yes, one app node handles 100 users a, a, a minute or whatever. So you've scaled that to 1,000. Do you have 1,000 database connections that you can, can you handle that many transactions? Right. And that's where we've obviously gotten in trouble, uh, where we've seen some of those things where people are like, oh, we need to scale this app. Like, OK, how do you want to scale it? Well, it just needs to handle this many requests. Right. Right. Without any underlying context of, you know, where are all those requests coming from? Are they all coming from the same data center? Right. Or, like, is there an edge set up between all of this that's going to help route the traffic in a, you know, efficient way? Um and the yeah, time. if we're just talking app scalability, yeah, you can't beat you can't beat Kubernetes. Um, well, yeah, I, I also think you brought up a point where honestly, before <clears throat> you scale anything, find the bottleneck, right? Because I think the first thing people do is exactly what you said. They're like, "Oh my god, my app needs more. Like it's getting more users. It needs more replicas. Then I'm yeah. going to buy and throw money at whatever it takes to have 25 instances of my website, right? Like." I don't care, ABDUS, take my money. I need 25. And then they realize it's no faster than it was with one. Like, what the hell is happening? 
Well, that's because you have to look at what, what's the bottleneck. The bottleneck is most likely going to always be your database. That's like forever and always been the bottleneck in all of my history, no matter what. It's like you can only scale your app to a certain number. And it's usually a low number before then you have to start looking at your database and start scaling your database. And then you can raise the app count again, but then you're going to hit another number that makes it so that you have to start scaling the database again. So it's a give and go kind of back and forth. Um, but you definitely have to find that bottleneck first, and that's where you scale. You know, There's no silver bullet of just creating more apps. And that's the thing is Kubernetes will do that for you. It'll, just, it'll scale the apps. So it's not super smart. It's very smart, but not like incredibly smart. Well, it will go all the way up to 25, regardless of the database size. It won't scale your database for you because that's kind of an instance usually. Like you usually define an instance of your database, like what it is, right? So you would have to manually change your instance size to scale your database for then the new replicas to take advantage of that speed and that storage or those threads or connections or whatever. So definitely, definitely. Yes, yeah, so people build out pools, right? So yeah. the pooling concept, I think, is probably the most common one. Thread pools, CP, you know, thread pools, app pools, DB pools. I think even CPU pools in a lot of cases where, right? Um, you know, that level. Still, though, it's a strategic thing. Um, mm. As is, as with most things, it's not just simply if problem then fix. You know, end routine. It's okay. What's happening? Like to your point. So where's the bottleneck? Maybe yeah. not even what's the where's the bottleneck. Let's just look at the architecture real quick. Like even if we found this bottleneck, if we just throw a bunch of stuff at it, what other problem are we about to create? Right? If somebody goes in and says scale the database, what does that mean? Like create another one? Yeah. Right? Like right. Okay, are you syncing the data between the two? Do you have two completely different, you know, the, the the normal questions that don't really get answered because frankly most of this is happening I mean, in IT, right? Like most of this is happening because we're in the middle of an incident. Something has broken. Mm -hmm. And so it's just somebody push the plus button until it goes away. <laughs> um, instead of planning all of this stuff out. And then I think the only other thing is just, we have to get into this. You have to build the app correctly for scale yeah. as well. Yeah. You can't just, not saying you can't scale Hello World, but uh, sometimes it's not as simple as just write your app and then multiply. Yeah, and then that's a great segue to something that I, I was thinking about bringing up earlier, but mm -hmm. now I can bring it up now, um, <laughs> which is a topic that we've brought up many times uh, within personal conversation, career, like at our jobs, and I think even on this podcast of like, how far do you engineer the app before you ship it? Because yeah. there's always optimizations, right? Like you can write the code really, really well, you can have this incredible architecture. And then all of a sudden you wake up one morning, you're like, ah, I can add an edge server. Okay, let me build the edge. Server. Oh, I can add a caching layer. Okay, let me do that. Oh, I can improve this function and use um, generics. Okay, let me do that. You know, but the app will never go live. So <laughs> I guess there's the general question of when do you just say enough is enough, screw it. No one's going to use this thing. I don't need to scale for a million users a month just yet. I will, I will fix that problem when it comes, you know, mm -hmm. and you just get it out there. And then if it does scale to a million, you're like, holy crap, this is a nice problem to have. I get to actually sit down and figure out what the hell I can do to get this thing running again because I'm so popular. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's that fine line, right? It's hard to judge because you're exactly right. You have to write it efficiently. You have to write the code well. You have to know when to quit and just give up and decide, look, I'm not going to get a million users overnight. Like, screw it. Who cares yeah. if this sort function has five for loops? Send it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, five right. for loops is not going to make and break, you know, two users a month, right? Like, screw it. So then I guess, uh, so then I, I, that, that was actually, I think, something Eric and I talked about a little bit because um, I was talking to him. It's like, well, why wouldn't you? Because I was just, you know, doing a proof of concept because, I mean, I didn't know anything about Kubernetes or anything like that. And then it was just like, well, it's easy enough, I guess, to implement from the beginning. Um, and I mean, I guess that's what I was trying to figure out. It's like, so is the cost really is the complexity in that you're building something that is not as straightforward and really maybe should it just be, you know, do you draw the line at building it as a Docker image, like a containerized app first that's like capable of being plugged into a, like an orchestration framework? And have it and draw the line there that's like okay it's wrapped up in a neat box no need to go build the orchestration it's just ready if i need to do that 
or is there anything to say that like, hey, we'll just, you know, have it ready to go in a Kubernetes environment with that in mind. But, you know, but like you said, you don't have to orchestrate or uh, come up with every other service you could possibly come up with as well. You got to have a V2. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there we go. You don't you have, have a V2. backlog, man. That's right. Yeah. So and that's actually a great point. You can always have a V2, right? It doesn't mean the first product you ship, let's say it gets 20 users, 30 users. You can realize, you know what? This is awesome, but this isn't going anywhere anytime fast. I got time to really improve and sit down and make this better before it becomes a problem, before I get 1,000, 10,000, right? Um, and that will hopefully and usually take a long time so that you can meet that goal and then you're not like forced into adopting stupid solutions, right? But I also think the biggest rule of thumb that I've now learned to always do is when you're building anything, there's a lot of shortcuts in this world, like Superbase. Love the product, incredible product, really good. Same with uh, Google Firebase, right? I was a huge Firebase fan. I loved it. It was so simple, but it gets you locked in. And so when you need to scale and you find out that Superbase is the problem, then you're kind of screwed. Or if Firebase is the problem, you're kind of screwed because you have now centered your entire application, your entire architecture around this product and around a product that only exists by you know this company, right? Like Firebase is very unique. Now, of course, you can build a whole you know ETL tool to move it out and put it onto, say, AWS, but like, holy crap, that sucks. So instead, build the app to be like substrate agnostic. Like you can literally rip it out of say Google Cloud and deploy it to AWS instantly. It's super simple. And that goes to your point with Docker. Docker allows you to do that. Kubernetes allows you to do that. A lot of these open source tools like Postgres are everywhere. So don't use Aurora DB on AWS because then now you're on AWS forever. You know, if you have 2 million rows on Aurora, <laughs> like you kind of, you, you know, like sure, again, you can build an ETL tool, but time is money and you know, users are getting pissed or there's an incident going on and you're trying to get this data out of here. Like, you know what I mean? Like it can, it can get crazy. So just build it from the ground up. So that way at any point, at any reason, if things are getting too expensive or you want to go somewhere else, you can literally just lift it, boop, deploy it somewhere else. There should be no um, hooks into your application with like, prim like uh, tools that only exist on that platform, right? Um, proprietary is the word. That's what I was looking for. No proprietary tools. Well, so you build data layers, right? And abstractions, like you don't have to, you don't have to bake in specific Postgres driver specific calls, right? You use a, like some kind of abstracted database driver, or then you write a data layer on top of it, which you probably should be doing anyway, because you should have abstracted objects that you're working with. But the idea is simple, like be able to move your architecture if you need to. Yeah, if, if you start out exactly. today and you start off on a, on a small Postgres database, that's great. What happens? Yeah. What if what if uh, what if somebody tweets it and now all of a sudden you you have to jump this thing up to enterprise scale in a week? Um, you probably can't do that on whatever plan of Postgres you're on. So maybe exactly. you do have to jump up to some bigger platform. You shouldn't have to rewrite your entire app to make that happen, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's because you picked Postgres as a solution, right? If you pick okay. say Firebase, yeah. right, like. I'm yep. sure Firebase being Google has very expensive and even enterprise plans, but let's say they don't. Let's say Firebase is, you know, only for hobbyists and for devs, and that's why it's free and everyone loves it for like little hack projects. But now your hack project, like you said, is now scaling like crazy. And you're like, holy crap, how the hell can I get Firebase to scale? I can't. I'm screwed. Like, <laughs> and it's proprietary because Firebase isn't like anything else. It's unique. But because you started off that sentence saying you have a low tier Postgres, well, now your options are endless because, yeah, Postgres is everywhere. You can, of, of course, you can scale the Postgres instance because AWS has Postgres, Google has Postgres, every, everyone has a Postgres instance that will go as far as the blank check will take you, right? It'll be like whatever money you want to give them, they'll scale that for you. So, you know, setting yourself up from the beginning with open source tools or non proprietary locked in ecosystems, right? That's, I think, the biggest win. So, or like, um, Maybe a better maybe maybe a better example like uh, you need to shift off of a platform due to like competition or something, mm -hmm. right? My, really, my point is just every piece of the architecture should be 
able to be, uh, you know, in a perfect world, you can move any piece of it to something else by only having to manipulate that piece. Oh yeah, right? yeah, okay. Like and every yeah. everything is interface driven essentially. Like, yes, you yes, call yes, it dependency yes. injection. Yeah. You know, service layer. Yeah, yeah, like that, yeah. So like you're you're even saying like if I have all everything on AWS, but I'm like holy crap for some reason AWS just jacked the price of their Postgres, but Azure is still dirt cheap. I'm just going to move only my database to Azure. Everything else can stay on AWS, sure. and it also yeah. works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now that's a, that's a whole another step, is right? Like you build your ecosystem to not be locked in, right? You're not using things that will prevent you from ever moving, but it's all interconnected with like you said, abstractions and data layers. So that way, if you do need to move only one piece, you have even that extra level of flexibility, right? So there's like two, at least major levels of flexibility, for sure. Yeah, can, but it all goes into scaling too. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say, can you can you build your data abstraction to the point that uh, you could move from something like a, a managed database service to uh, to like a Postgres, like, or, or vice versa? Of I mean, course. Yeah, because I mean, at the end of the day, one tier of your app, whatever level you want to, whatever it is, how many ever layers of abstraction you have, eventually something calls the database, right? Something yep. is going to interact with the database at a driver level. That thing should be the only thing that changes because as far as everything above it's concerned, it's only interacting with an interface that it's being supplied with, right? Call it a yep. data layer, call it an API, call it whatever you want, but that's the thing that changes. Because like if you yeah. say like get users, you have a function called get users. Mm -hmm. Why would that change just because the database platform changes? At the end of the day, it should be returning a list of user objects, which like I was saying earlier, should already be defined. Yeah. You know? um, it just may be, yeah, yeah, depending on the migration, it may be a massive chore, depending on the amount of objects and the, sure. you know, the, yeah, but the I mean, variation yeah. in schema. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. Data migration, uh, never fun, um, yeah. never has been in the history of you know bits being stored uh no never fun but the the point really being like you don't have to make your app suffer because of that chore right one yeah, yeah one has no idea it doesn't care right if you're if you're a 10x engineer <laughs> and you have big brain foresight you can even make it a blue green swap so that there's literally zero downtime you know nice. because Everything is abstracted to the point where you can literally flip a switch and things just go from pointing to A to now pointing to B instantly. Mm. And I'm glad you brought, no brought up blue green. Yeah, no user oh, nice. has to be wiser. Okay. So. Yeah, so now you're getting into resiliency, right? Yeah. Which is kind of an offshoot of the scalability aspect. But like mm -hmm. pure scalability does not necessarily guarantee resiliency. You Correct. scale your app up, you know, 10 times. That does not mean that you can perform zero downtime migration, right? There has to be some other layer for the blue green aspect. Like how do you direct traffic to the blue while the green is being updated or it's, right. maybe it's vice versa or whatever it is. Right. So now like, like I love that 10 X engineer. So like you're thinking ahead, but it's your architecture, right? You've built an architecture that has some intelligence in built into the load balancer or in the network routing that will let you direct traffic down a certain pathway given a condition, right? Canary testing, same problem, not even same problem, same concept, right? I want to let Will test the new beta. Jay, I want still on, you know, uh, LTS. Stable, yeah. Like, right, so how do you do that? I mean, you got to have criteria, you got to have, you know, like I said, intelligence built into the, the infrastructure, and then your yeah. app tier has to be able to support that as well. Could you ship two different versions of your app to the same infrastructure? Can it connect to the same database? Like all of that, that's the that's the foresight that I think that's the over engineering, right? Are you doing that in your V1? That seems a bit much, right? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Right. And boy, have I done that in my V1. <laughs> of course. And, and of course. that's why I don't have anything shipped. Yeah, but how good does it feel though when when somebody comes back and they say, Okay, it's really starting to, this is really starting to pick up. We need to start thinking about, you know, observability and scalability. And you, you're able to go, already done. Done, yep. turn it on. Yep. Yeah. Glad you asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was hoping you would because, boy, I put in a lot of hours just for this. Yeah. <laughs> just for this conversation, I put in a lot of hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Why is this one point story just turned into an eight? Well, yeah, well, things got out of control. <laughs> I had to have well, the greatest logging mechanism of all time. And, and I <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, happen. and I, I just heard something about I, I was listening to somebody talking about software development and, and I can't remember something about being like $2 million already in to a project that had not even released yet already spent $2 million on development. And that just sounds kind of like that where you've just built so much and you've hired a bunch of engineers to build this way complicated system. And unless you have people lined up out the door that are anxious to use it, you're probably in a lot of trouble. You're, you're, you've, you've waited way into the over-engineered territory and it's going to be very tough to recover. That's a sunk cost like fallacy, Jay, and you can't exactly. stop now. <laughs> you might as well keep going yeah, until it's going. Done. Yeah, absolutely. How do you think you develop a gambling problem? Like, yeah. You're eventually going to get out of this hole. You're eventually going to get out of gamblers hole. quit before they win big, Jay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great what point. It, uh, the night is darkest before the dawn, not to be cheesy or whatever, but like, of course. I mean, just got to push through. Yeah. Good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you need more, right. you need more like maverick developers where it's like, look, we're going to hack and slash V1. We're not even going to call it V1. This is like V.1 alpha. Sure. We're going to hack this thing together and this thing's going live. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Kick yeah. it out the door. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. I mean, um, that's, that's, yeah, that's probably more what I would operate. Um, I was actually, I was actually just reading about, um, Beehive uh, is one of the newsletter platforms um, that uh, it's gotten pretty popular really, uh, recently. It's been doing really well, but that was partly what they did. It was like he he's I was reading the guy that I think did a lot of the development for it and uh, the founder, I suppose. And he was talking about how he, he released that at the same time when there's things like Substack and ConvertKit. There's a bunch of other newsletter platforms as well. Um, but he said that that was kind of his big advantage was that they pushed it out fast and it was definitely the worst when it first came out, but they just uh, shipped a ton of features quickly. Like anytime anybody talked about anything, it's like, all right, we're doing that. Anytime they, somebody complained about it or they wish they did that or whatever, and basically just paid attention to any kind of feedback they got and just worked really fast to turn that around. And it helped them grow a ton because, you know, a lot of the other... Yeah. Uh, other apps are too slow. I mean, they're they're solid. They start out well, but they don't change that fast. So you definitely can win uh, win some users back by being able to ship the ship the features quickly. You mean you don't have to take feedback and then spend three months arguing and refining that into literally just doing the one sentence that it said to begin with? <laughs> you can. Yeah. Uh, you, it, it's certainly one way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No more Comic Sans. Okay, now we got to establish a focus group. Let's find out what everybody's feeling about Comic Sans. Let's run no, this, this up is, the flag. Uh, no. Just, just this is it. my best. Uh, my best example that you know, and Jay, but Eric is, uh, definitely, is that you build a feedback platform. You spend sprints, months, quarters, building a feedback platform to store and manage feedback to then do what with it? Nothing. <laughs> Nice. Don't okay. even use it. Yeah. Like we we're taking in user feedback and then the engineers are like, dude, this is cool. We're getting feedback. Like people are using our stuff. Uh, so product people, um, what's our next story? Like, should we maybe look at the backlog and make a feature request based on feedback? No. no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we Onto spend the... months building this platform to take feedback for no reason. Yep. Okay. Just so many yeah. other shiny things to do. got to go on to the next yeah. one. Yeah, man. I think you have to scale the feedback the whole time because there's <laughs> that's another thing. And then now you're scaling this platform that's not even useful. I don't know. Makes no sense. Speaking, go, go, trying to circle back to scalability, right? You know, that's user right. data and all that. Um, yeah. No, but that's, I mean, that's a good point, right? So something goes out the door, everybody moves on to the next shiny thing. What happens, right? Things just get mothballed until there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like it's not a, very rare do we get to just push something out into prod and just dust our hands off and never look at it again. Like it just, these things don't, these things don't happen. They require maintenance and upkeep and upgrades to the, you know, container oh, yeah. versions and all that. Um, and then we don't get the time to do it. Then it turns into an incident. Now we're right back where we started. Yeah. 
Um, and then all the again, knowledge is left, so no one knows well, how because it Because we works. have a plan going in, right? So many times, like there's no plan <laughs> yeah. going into it. It's just app goes live. Does it work well enough? Yeah. Okay, fine. You know, until all of a sudden something starts hitting it at 2,000 requests a minute or whatever. Um, no, we plan for it. Yeah. Here's a question. When do you use vertical scalability and when do you use horizontal scalability? How do you know to use one or the other? Or is there a way to know one or the other? Is it scenario based? Is it product based? Like use horizontal for databases, use vertical for apps, or is it both just depending, you know? So yeah, throwing that question out there. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I guess I, I, was, I was trying to think of like different scenarios. So I guess it would be, uh, so just from, I don't know, things I've been reading about late, lately, I was thinking horizontal scaling sounds like a, we have a million users and we need to scale, like we suddenly have a million users, so we have to scale horizontally to be able to handle that um, versus uh, high frequency trading, which is vertical. Like we need this to be as fast as physically possible. So we are going to vertically uh, scale this as much as possible, or we're going to like, we are we have custom hardware, we are writing custom you know, firmware and drivers for that hardware to make sure it is fast as possible. So speed. So, but I hear speed in both. So speed is not, um, I guess a, uh, a quality or not a quality, I guess an attribute to look for, because I see speed in both of those scenarios, right? One is speed for your app and one is speed for frequency trading. So how would you differentiate then? Like when, like, how do you know, I don't know. How do you yeah. know to use one or the other? That's good. <laughs> one, yeah. one can lose you millions of dollars. The other one gets you a bad mention on Twitter. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Uh, it's just interesting yeah. because you know you can you can do both for both, and I think you definitely can. Yeah, for but here's the difference. I think horizontally scaling an application for a bunch of users, like an influx of users, likely cost of that much, 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 much less than vertically scaling a high frequency trading platform where you have to hire very specialized engineers. You're likely building your own hardware, right? Maybe not like literally manufacturing and fabricating the chips. Maybe you are though, but you're, you're building something so specific to the problem because you need every single nanosecond of performance you can pull out of that. Website performance? Well, I mean, what is it? Like three seconds is the... Yeah, the bare minimum. Seconds, whatever the number is. Like yeah. you're trying to hit a threshold. And in right. a lot of cases, yeah, you're probably able to scale up. That's that's kind of a misnomer, right? Scale out your architecture for that. But you're not you're not horizontally scaling a high frequency trading app. I can't imagine, right? You're very focused, technical stack, very isolated, very unique for like a single primary focus. Yeah, and that's yeah, so what if you were to... sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say I was trying to figure out the yeah, terminology, but it's hard not to because it's like, well, maybe it's I guess. Maybe it's not speed, but in some cases it is speed or it's efficiency, I guess, maybe. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's maybe maybe efficiency because really efficiency kind of applies to both. Maybe not. Maybe horizontal horizontal scaling is, is, is less about. Right? Yeah, more about performance. Yeah, performance, I guess, maybe is the term to, to use there. But I was just thinking like horizontal or vertical feels more like uh, how do we look at, you know, basically optimizing every single like optimizing the route through the app, I guess, as opposed to horizontal is more so just like how do we handle uh quantity i guess you know yeah. so i guess i can throw a couple of scenarios some will be easier than others i think okay maybe they'll all be easy uh you have a rest api do you horizontal or vertical just just rest api let's just say it's returning um basic information it's not you know not, like don't overcomplicate right like just think of a basic api not the database we're not scaling the database just the service itself that's running the rest api code so what do you do with this service are you, are you in corner vertical or corner horizontal i mean first thought would be horizontal i mean it's, it's back to like assuming infinite database <laughs> assuming we don't care about it yeah we don't care about the database, database. okay we don't okay. care about the database i mean i, I would think in in that case you probably vertically scale first because you're trying to see how much you can get out of that single instance, right? Now, if you've boundary tested a single instance and you know you've met that threshold, then you just, you go to horizontal scaling. Okay. Right? Okay. So now, what about the database? So now you have horizontally scaled your app because that sounds like the consensus because I agree. I think I think that's a fair assessment. So what do you do with the database now? Do you horizontal and make replicas 
or do you uh, vertical and just make bigger, 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 bigger database instances with more and more gigs? I mean, I know you don't answer a question with a question, but like, what's our SLAs on this thing? Do we? <laughs> we are Facebook. Is it? Oh. Um, or big yeah, tech. Yeah, I mean, at that point, needs, like, you know, billions of people it needs to be fast. You know, we're not, we're not going to architecture it, but like, what do you think the database plan is for servicing an app or a website that requires such high traffic? Like, do you think they have 1 million tiny databases or six global massive petabyte databases, right? Like we're talking about as big as you can get vertically or as big as you can get horizontally. What do you think is the end goal for like a database um, scalability problem? Hmm. Probably somewhere in between, I'm, yeah, I would I, guess. Yeah. I would almost think you'd have to pick and choose based on the service. Like if you're, is this a service-based architecture? Because like at that point, right, you would encapsulate your database. That is not, doesn't necessarily have to be one giant monolith database that it connects to, right? If you've got a fairly intelligent distributed network of being able to ETL the data across the relevant data, or you have some way to aggregate it somewhere, like a, like a warehouse that you're pulling out of, you could easily just do both. Like services scale themselves. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there's probably some centralized database at at some level, right? But if you mean it's like not one, one, to one right? database, that seems, that seems a bit much. Mm. It's probably not one to one, right? You're not going to have 500 yeah. replicas of your API, 500 databases, maybe like right. 100 to one, right? 100 services to one database. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the boundary test, right? Is from a vertical perspective, it's you boundary test that machine or whatever the equivalent of it is. How much juice can you get out of it? Mm. Then horizontally scale to find the boundary of how many clients can you connect to that database and still get reasonable performance against your non-functionals from there right then you just rinse and repeat but at a certain point right you do hit a boundary where you you simply can't do anymore without replicating one of the underlying pieces and now now the question is like do you keep them in sync do they need to be in sync or is it like simply for this feature it's actually five calls to five different services that have five different databases right yeah like our micro like our micro front ends right yeah. Um, okay. So another scenario would be like a rendering platform. So like Twitch, what we're using right now, Zoom, right? All these video rendering platforms, they have to do live encoding and decoding. And a lot of graphics cards, I'm sure, are involved in a lot of, you know, very complicated architecture to pass this along. So do you skip? Because, you know, who... Who buys a gaming PC, right? Like, you know, you want the most powerful. So in, in a sense, you want the most vertical scaled computer to play games on because then you have the most juice to do all that rendering and have all that power. It's not like I'm playing Call of Duty with seven computers that are daisy chained to make a supercomputer. I just get one massive computer, <laughs> right? So for a rendering platform like Zoom or Twitch or all these other video platforms, how would you scale an application like that? Would you do horizontal only? like we did in the past, you know, because you just want to make replicas of the application. But then do you just want to do one massive supercomputer that can do all the rendering for you, basically, mostly vertical. To be honest, when you said rendering, I was thinking of Blender. <laughs> that, kind of I mean, rendering. that's a service too. You could yeah. build a yeah. service that does, uh, yeah, Blender. Oh, no, you rendering. definitely can do that. I mean, that's, that, I think that's what we, I think we did that in college. Like that was one of our projects for um, multi-node computing was like you set up a Blender render farm. <laughs> um, or something like that. I don't know. It's been too long, but I mean, yeah, you have, then you have multiple machines because you can farm out the tasks, right? And in all likelihood, there's no reasonable expectation that you would be getting results in real time. Like there's just, you know, that job has a certain expectation of it's going to take a while, whatever that mm -hmm. means. But it doesn't mean you don't still try to vertically scale every one of those individual machines, right? If you can throw, you know, the best and brightest graphics card and, you know, multiple CPUs and a machine and times 10, you got the money for it, do it. So, okay. So I guess that's the thing is like, I mean, I don't have an AWS calculator in front of me, nor do I want to like spend the time really going through every single scenario. But like, I am curious because 
you can keep doing that. Like you said, like you can keep buying bigger instances and you can keep throwing more graphics cards at the problem, whether it be through a cloud platform or through your own financial money at it, like a home lab system. But then, yeah, cost, right? You brought that mm-hmm. up. Even if it's the best solution or maybe the best solution, probably a, a graph out there that maybe someone's made where vertical scaling is more cost efficient to a point and then you have to go horizontal or horizontal scaling is cost efficient to a point and then you might as well go vertical because again it maybe depends on bandwidth costs so internet versus hardware versus infrastructure versus maintenance right like all these costs come into play and that makes all these questions even more complicated because now it's not just what's easiest right like oh i can ship 500 instances of my app easy i literally just change the replica count to 500 or i can buy six more server racks because maybe that's better because the graphics card costs will yield so much more performance that it's actually worth the cost benefit. I don't know. Hmm. You can see my dog. She's, yeah. she's, on, <laughs> she's on the couch now. Nice. But yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's such a, I think basically what I was trying to get out of all of this is like, it seems like there's no answer to any of these questions. It's all situational. It's all every single thing. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. And that's, I think that's what people get hung up on when they try to scale is they only do vertical or they only do horizontal because they think that that's what you should do. But even basic scenarios. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I'm on a team right now where we have a database that is huge because we're told that if there's an error, like literally we we have a queue and if the queue gets, it gets processed, right? And if the queue count goes up too high, we get an alert saying it's not being processed enough because we have too many threads being used. So the database is the bottleneck. So we literally scaled it. That's it's literally in the docs. Troubleshoot, scale database up. <laughs> it's literally <laughs> like that's there how you go. solve it. And then you'll start seeing the queue count go down because now we're <laughs> able to process more requests a second. And we've actually hit the highest available tier of available. Like we're we're done. We're out. There's no oh, more. Yeah. So we have design discussions on um, what to do next. So yeah. we we literally vertical scaled as far as you can possibly vertical scale. Crazy. Hmm. Yeah. I, don't I know. mean, that's really the end, the end goal of this whole thing. Just like most of these big concepts, there's not a way to do it. There really just isn't. And I'm that's the hard it. part. Trying to convince people of that is really hard. Like you can't just take like, well, well, so and so added scalability to their app. We should just be able to copy paste what they did, right? Yeah. True. Right. I mean, it was the, the, uh, the standard frustrating senior engineer answer is it depends. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, it yeah, does. absolutely. No, it does. I just did a presentation last week about logging strategy across like, you know, all of our cross system orgs. And there's literally a slide that said, how do we do it? It depends. <laughs> that was it, like, it really is. And that's, right. that's how the discussion went was just like, Everybody wants to be told, how do I log for my app, right? Yep. No different here. Like, how do I scale my app? Mm. What are you trying to do? Like, like, what is your end goal? And then we'll get there. Yeah, because I mean, yep. like, here's the thing. You, if you're purely domestic here, how much are you really worried about necessarily horizontally scaling? I mean, is it really going to make that big of a difference if the app is hosted on the West Coast and you get a bunch of East Coast users? At this point, probably not. There's other yeah. there's other technologies you can put in place to kind of ease that tension, right? Throw in a CDN, and you, you might be good. Okay. Or just or, or employ an orge, uh, an edge network, right? To to shorten the network traffic. Mm-hmm. But now all of a sudden, Europe, you know, it goes huge over there. Well, that's a little bit further for the wire to travel, right? Now it goes into Asia, APAC, and you know, I think you said Oceanic. I don't even know what that is. Uh, Oceanic is. Um, I think it's mostly Asian and Australia. Yeah, Australia. Right, Australia. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, now now you have a way different problem on your hand. Now you're talking about it, it's it almost has to be vert- or horizontal scaled because mm-hmm. you're going to be putting these nodes geographically closer to the traffic, right? But it could be a it could be a vertical scaling problem too because like what if you don't have a good database replication strategy in place and that database is sitting in say like I don't know US East one. Yeah, you got to figure out how to get all that traffic to US East One as fast as possible. Yeah, I was gonna say, would you do loading. Would you do a database per region and then just have a data lake syncing all of the regions to one master database for you know large scale analytics, large scale 
um, you know, processing. But essentially, as long as every user from said region goes through the same, you know, let's call it like flow, then they will always access the same data and they'll always get back the same data because that's where their data lives. It's like blah, blah, blah. And then let's say they get on a plane and they fly over and we realize, oh, crap, you're in a different region now. Your data is over here. We don't have your data on US East. Well, hmm. we have that central data lake at least so that way we can do a long, it would, you know, it's a long jump, but we'll get it to you and then it can store it in say like a local cache and then maybe, I don't know, like there's a lot of architecture. I'm probably butchering it, but like, is that at least a decent strategy? You know, one database per region and then a data lake that syncs it all together in case they hop regions or, you know, maybe. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned analytics and I mean, we could, you could probably bump telemetry and stuff into that same bucket, right? Now you're talking about eventing data. So, you know, does that even the same as kind of your line of business data? Like if you add instrumentation to your app because you want to measure performance in real time, um, does that belong in the same code path and the same logic lines as line of business data, right? Yeah. Well, it sounds like, uh, uh, I don't know, you get into like privacy laws and that kind of thing too. So like it has, you know, separation. Perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Now, yeah. So let's say uh, GDPR or um, EU laws say the data has to be resident and cannot leave EU soil. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm just saying, I mean, like, I'm not saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happens, but, you know, government like, yeah. type contracts could easily make that. Now right. what do you do? Right. Now you literally have to have the long ping from, all right, you're in America. Welcome to the States. But we have to ping you all the way back, you know, because we can't let your data leave. Yeah, exactly. So how do you handle replication? How do you handle, I'm sorry, not replication. How do you handle duplication? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You have to have like a, I don't know, because if you're going to yeah, duplicate between regions, then you, I don't know, have a service that checks the date time and, you know, figure it out like this hasn't been touched in six oh, months. Time so stamps. Duplicate, so yeah. Across yeah. regions. Are yeah. You <laughs> now you have an MDM <laughs> strategy that has to go in place, right? You need, you need some kind of master data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how much of that can actually be done? Right, because if 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 the contract says the data can't leave the soil, but you don't want to have duplicate users, you kind of need to know who those users are, or at least some metadata about them so that you can dedupe them, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, so now you have this other scalability problem, which is like, and the whole point really I was trying to make was just at, at a certain point, you you architect it in a way that it just conforms to scalability, right? Yeah. And then you just add the, you should be able to apply restrictions like that by other means. You don't have to bake that stuff into the application. It's just simply you, the instance of your application, whatever that means. It might mean one little server with a database. It could mean 20 servers with 20 databases. It doesn't really matter, but you just, it's over here now. And then you isolate it with like a network layer. Back to that original point of you could sit there and tack on AWS services from now until the cows come home. I mean, go look up just like, basic static website architecture on AWS, there's like eight services attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, because they, you know, they're like, oh, well, you could use CloudFront to make sure it gets delivered as fast as possible and, you know, edge caching and all these things. Like, you know, yeah, you could. You could architect it to death. Yeah. Um, but long story short, you don't need that for V1. Fair enough. Nope. Probably Just not. Do a little, uh, little no code, hack something together and you're good to go. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh yeah get it out the door start cashing them checks <laughs> just, yeah that is that is definitely more of the uh the side hustle business mentality it's like get just get a, better yet get a wait list of users before you even have anything and then build the thing so uh yeah definitely two million dollars until you have a product that's what i'm hearing or right. or go that way yeah or that way yeah <laughs> <laughs> go the uh yeah the i mean direction. what are you building it's easier to scale more. It's, e it's always easier to scale when you have money and users. If you're trying to scale with no money and no users, that's a lot harder because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you're draining your wallet faster than you should be. You should, yeah. yeah. We don't can handle 50,000 concurrent users. How many do you yeah. have? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, we can handle 50. That's right. We're ready. And that's the thing is like this, <laughs> this actually uh, helps all of those um, like quick, you know, POC to production type projects is like computers these days are so powerful and fast, right? Like nothing has to be perfect for it to run. Like you could build a terrible 
crappy, like junior engineer, horrible app, and it's going to service probably a thousand people per second, just fine, because of how powerful phones are, because of how powerful computers and how efficient garbage collection and you know depending on what language you choose, but most languages have garbage collection and all this stuff, right? So because of how efficient and powerful all these things are, like no matter how crappy and beginner or just scrappy the code is, it's probably going to handle at least minimum, probably a thousand. So you have a long way before you have to start worrying about V2 and scalability, no matter how you build the damn thing. So yeah, just build it and ship it. You know, it's probably going to be fine for a, a long while. Yeah. yeah. Then you deal with the angry engineer you bring in later to rebuild it. Yeah. It's just like, why did you do this? But you know, that's yeah, temporary but, though. Yeah. But that guy gets to charge his, he gets to pick his own, price so you know because now you need him yeah that's true yeah could be worse all right I think the only other thing is just scaling for resiliency right so we're talking a lot of scaling from a performance perspective but like just simple like very basic resiliency like disaster recovery what if junior engineer writes the worst piece of code in, on the planet and it doesn't garbage collect and it just the memory it's got leaks all over the place and the thing just grows out of control you got to have two instances running i mean just, just in case. And that's, yeah, that's or, a, another thing that's super easy. To or build. crash gotcha. crash recovery, right? Crash recovery, I mean, yeah. That's a beautiful thing that Kubernetes has. It's so, again, it's so smart. Like if something crashes, it won't finish the deployment. Like it literally will always have, I mean, that's the blue green. It will always have two instances running. When you deploy the new one, it keeps the old one right there. It's building up the new one. Now you have two. And then it will test the new one. And if it, if everything's running and nothing's crashing, then it will delete and replace. So, because I've seen deployments, my own deployments, literally go out and then it's in a crash loop. I'm like, well, it's a good thing this runs on Kubernetes because no one knows that I just broke the app because no, like you, you literally don't notice. And so then I just check what's wrong, look at the logs. Oh, yeah, nil exception. Whoops. All right, fix the nil exception. Push another thing. Now we're back. You know, nice. Love oh it. man. Yeah, that just takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> Sounds like we need to have a future future chat about your QA process. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kubernetes is so nice that I do write unit tests. But sometimes, you know, there's an edge case that I didn't cover. So then you you fix it, add it to the unit test, and you're good. And, and who knows? Nobody. Because nothing actually went down. So it's just such a good safety net, you know? It's it's nice to have. I got to ask I got to ask a team on the call today, mostly tongue in cheek, but I got to uh, literally say the words, but we don't have null exceptions anymore, do we, team? <laughs> <laughs> to uh, crickets. Yes. <laughs> uh, just because, I mean, how many times do you get bit by, well, it's not supposed to be null. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. that's why it's called an exception. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What right. do you mean? <laughs> yeah. That's a good call. I mean, and then things happen too, right? So, like, what if, what if you're blue green deploying or you're canary testing something? And you didn't handle a specific data scenario, and that entire node crashes, right? So your scale then helps you because, it, like, talking about it in the guise of resiliency, right? Because you want to have a backup plan, a DR type situation. But, um, but once again, that goes into the plan, right? What are you scaling mm -hmm. for? Are you scaling just for performance? Okay, fine, do it. But are you know, are you also scaling for disaster recovery and? Do you have contractual obligations to meet SLAs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Like all of that stuff comes together. And maybe it is as simple as just configuring a few settings in Kubernetes and the tool does the magic, but I would imagine it gets a little more complicated than that most of the time for most of most people. Oh yeah. No, I mean even Kubernetes gets complicated, right? Like um there's mm -hmm. stateful sets and stateless and there's, there's lots of variations to how you want an application to run, even in Kubernetes. And so sometimes you you want it to vertically scale. So you don't even use the horizontal feature. And there's so many people deploying to your cluster that you don't have the CPU and memory. Like it's all gone. Like everyone else is using that cluster just like you. And you're like, but I want a vertical scale. Like I literally can't horizontal scale. This app has to vertical and there's no more CPU and memory. Everyone's eating it all. So what do you do? Right. And Kubernetes won't do anything for you automatically. But my team has been spending lots of time coming up with custom solutions where if that happens, it will find an app and kick it from the cluster. It's like, <laughs> all right, you're going to a new cluster and it will do a blue green deployment to a new cluster. 
no one will know that it changed clusters. No one on the customer side, right? The team will know. And then now we freed CPU and memory for that one app who's been screaming. It's like, okay, here you go. Fine, take it. Now you can, right? And then it will vertically scale to eat up those resources. So like stuff like that happens all the time. And it can get very complex if you're sharing, you know, a huge Kubernetes space with lots of clusters, lots of namespaces, lots of apps, all needing various scenarios and all wanting to scale in various ways. And they're all fighting for the same resources, right? They're mm -hmm. all going for the same stuff. So it's crazy. Cool. Yeah. I didn't know you guys were doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we're at just about an hour. So uh, it's a good scaling conversation there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I was going to, we can do some hot takes. Um, I know at least mm -hmm. for Eric, though, I have to ask how was Comic Con? Oh, yeah, it was awesome. Um, All right. <laughs> uh, I mean, we didn't get to see the Robert Downey Jr. announcement. So, I mean, you know, it's not like it wasn't on online eight seconds later. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, didn't miss much there. But no, I mean, we went and saw the normal stuff. All the uh, adult animation panels. Um, critical role. Dope as usual. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, got some sweet. Uh, got some sweet swag. Um, yeah. It's good, man. Um, nice and chill. That's awesome. awesome. Glad to hear. Um, and then I don't know if you have a hot take to go on top of that, but um, what's your hot take on Robert Downey Jr. being Doctor Doom? Man, honestly, um, I didn't really get it at first. It was just kind of like, huh? I mean, it's a thing. <laughs> um, I don't know. Just seemed, I don't know. Just seemed out of place. Okay. Honestly, so you're not mad, but you're kind of like maybe disappointed. I mean, like like as long as they write the role correctly, he's going to, I mean, it's going to be awesome. Like if we're down to Judy could play anything. It'd be awesome. Um, but <laughs> the dude's iron man. Like I don't, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Just kind of, no, that, that's a common right thought. Here. That's a common thought. Um, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully those movies, when they come out, secret wars and what is it? Doomsday, I think is what they're calling it. Yeah. I think so. Doomsday. Yeah. Yep. Hopefully just, Hopefully they're just good stories. Like let's get back to phase one, two, and three type stories. Like, you know, yeah. Just tell a comic book yeah. story, please. <laughs> Fair enough. There. Yeah. No, is that, I, a hot I think... is that a hot enough take. I don't know. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvel yeah. cinematic universe. You're going to have people on both sides and then you're going to have people making a third side that doesn't exist because they're hoping for something else. You know, it's like, <laughs> no matter what you say, it's going to be a hot take. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Did you have anything, anything, Will, any, Hot takes. Let's see. You know, nothing too too crazy. Um, I'm trying to think of what I've done lately that may be controversial. Oh, I I, I finished this book, which is a good book. Yeah, yeah. Hail Mary, hmm. uh, Hail Mary Project, right? Yeah, by you know, the same guy who wrote The Martian, so Andy Weir. Um, and it's about interstellar travel, saving the Earth. Uh, very similar to The Martian, you know, with like one guy stuck trying to like live a life out in space or in the Martian <laughs> Mars and hear his thoughts in his process as a scientist. Um, I don't know. I guess my hot take about the current space industry, since I love space and the current news, I don't know if you guys know, is that like the Boeing Starliner uh, is like, so a piece of crap. <laughs> the astronauts are stranded on the ISS because Boeing at this point is just a trash company. Mm, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's my hot take is the government needs to stop privatizing the space industry and go back to its roots, what they do in this book, and go back to the 70s, you know, 60s and just make it themselves, you know, like don't pay Boeing to make any more rockets, please. Like just, you know, NASA, just do it like the good old days. Go back to doing it yourself. Stop trying to privatize the space industry. SpaceX, unfortunately, though, has been killing it. So that's a huge check in the privatized space industry corner. Like they, they're kind of killing it. Um, but this latest catastrophe with Boeing has just been terrible. So, yeah. I, let's. Just, the first thing I thought of when I, I read the most recent story that was like, there's a problem that the spacesuits aren't compatible, right? <laughs> like the Boeing spacesuits are not compatible with SpaceX's, I don't know, oh. ship or rocket or whatever it is. Like okay. some kind of thing. And all I could think of was just like, 
did, did nobody learn from the USB-C debacle over the years? Like, yeah. come up with a standard. Yeah. Well, that's the <laughs> right thing. Up. is like when the government decided to privatize the space industry, they gave out two massive contracts. More than They gave out more than two, but the two biggest There's ones, more than two, but... Yeah, there's more than two, but the two biggest ones was Boeing, which was bigger than SpaceX, and then SpaceX. And SpaceX has taken the money and basically just made you know diamonds out of coal like they've killed it and then boeing has taken gold and made it you know polished crap basically like it's just terrible so <laughs> i don't know it's it's it basically you can't gamble billions on billions in a 50 50 you know like might as well might as well just do it yourself and make it a guarantee yeah. I mean, I, I was going to say, I think SpaceX, uh, and, well, I think Elon actually lobbied to change how things were operating because of that problem where he went to performance based as opposed to cost plus where, and all, and also because he knew he could move a lot faster than Boeing because Boeing has, I forget, uh, maybe it's Boeing or Lockheed Martin. Somebody has like, like 50,000 employees. So they're not going to change. They're, they're mm -hmm. a massive entity that's just going to keep doing the same thing. Um, but that's why SpaceX can run circles around them. Uh, but I don't know. I think I think things like that are are what would uh, cause Boeing to not be in the race anymore. Anyway, like they're going to remove themselves from the race because they can't keep up. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, but it, it is it's not cool to, uh, I don't know, potentially create dangerous situations because they can't keep up, you know, so. Yeah, man, if I was an astronaut, like, I don't care what Boeing tells me. They're like, yeah, you know, hey. We we fixed all the systems on the ship. You should be gear. You should be good to detach and come home. I'd be like, I'm not getting that thing. <laughs> you, you can go and detach that and send it into orbit and burn up. I'm not going to be in it. I don't Somebody care. Call Elon. <laughs> Have Elon call, bring me like, home. <laughs> seriously, like SpaceX is killing it. They are very successful with all their missions. Boeing has been a disaster since they started. And yeah, I don't like the like if I'm an astronaut. To know that my life is basically a 50 50, depending on what privatized company is taking me up into space versus sure. back in the day, like, of course, NASA has very famous and well documented incidents and disasters and all that. But, like, again, like Eric said, everything was so scrutinized and standardized and perfected, and nothing went, you know, nothing went to, you know, quote unquote production without touching at least 100 people. And maybe it's the same in both of these other companies, but obviously, NASA did it way better than all of them because they went to the moon or anybody else. So like they, they're capable of incredible things. Like, you know, maybe go back to your roots and stick to what, you know, kind of a thing. I mean, if you hire the right people, good things happen generally. I mean, I think yeah. probably what it comes down to. That's for sure. Yeah. What is a, uh, uh <clears throat> oh man, the, the Charlie Munger quotes, like show me the incentives and I'll show you the result. So, uh, something like that. Hmm. Um, uh, but, uh, hmm. I have a think on that one. Uh, <laughs> uh awesome what's your hot well, there take we go. so yeah that's some yeah. some solid hot taking um oh man i just had one i don't remember what <laughs> it threw me off uh oh no i'm uh i'm sticking with over over engineering i'm team over engineering so i'm gonna just keep keep building out stuff uh way more than it needs to be built you know gotta gotta you can sell an idea you can exactly, still sell right? an idea yeah. oh yeah. You know? yeah it's like it's actually it's kind of funny i have a friend who joins uh, well, not joint, sorry, but goes with his startup to uh, startup uh, presentations, I guess, you know, to it's kind of like in a grand scheme, more, way more professional, like Shark Tank, right? Like there's okay. a lot of people there and they're all, there's hundreds of startups and there's probably hundreds of, you know, investors and it's just presentation after presentation after presentation. And then he's literally seen people go up and they have nothing but an idea. It's like, yeah, you're just selling an idea. You know, here's my architecture. Here's my problem statement. Here's my solution. Here's some screenshots from Figma. Uh, would you like to fund us? It's like, dude, you don't have anything. Like you, like, <laughs> but they do it, and some of them get money. So like, you can it's opportunity, you know, man. Yeah, straight up, just sell an idea. You don't have to build anything. It's a strategy for sure. I mean, kind of going back to like getting getting feedback from the beginning and just being able, as long as you can deliver, is really the only thing that matters. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely a strategy. It's risky, but I don't know. I, I also, I mean, yeah. I'd, that stuff's kind of fun too. I don't mind. I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, iterating quickly. So, uh, you know, maybe over engineer for a little while and then switch to iterating rapidly. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm going to stick with my over engineering for now. That's my hot take. Use HashiCorp. 
the best way to over-engineer anything is you use Hash Corp. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to dig into that ecosystem. Trust me, it's, good. it's brilliant open source software that is industry standard. But if you want to use any of them, holy crap, you have to be you have to like go back to school. It's so hard. <laughs> it's perfect. Over engineer to the max. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Terraform's not easy to know to learn? Oh man. We didn't even <laughs> I've never the, took the time. We uh, didn't even get to touch on Terraform. That'll be for the next one. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that was pretty solid. We 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 scaled this conversation to more than an hour and ten minutes. So uh that's pretty good. Nice. Um, and we've got our hot takes, so I think we're good for this one. So this is episode nine, finally in the books. Um, we'll see what happens with episode ten. But in the meantime, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good to see, so you, see you next time. See ya. See ya. Later.